Well, bonjour. bonjour. You're good. I mean, you're good. <laughs> I said, I don't know whether I should say good morning or should I say bonjour, but I think either one works very well here. Thank you very much. You are great. You make me feel so at home. Right from the foyer and now in front of you. Something is happening in this church. I don't know what it is, but I don't need to know. Because when the spirit is working, uh, the Bible said, the wind blows, you don't know where it's come from, where it's going, but you could sense it, right? And I think that's what I'm experiencing yesterday, and especially this morning, right here at this church. So I thank God for what he's doing with you guys. And I give him the praise and the glory for that. And uh, you need to kind of do whatever you can do to keep the momentum going. Because it seems like I'm visiting a new church. <laughs> uh, but I feel at home. I bring you greetings from my wife. Uh, some of you have met her. And there's no question about it. I'm married up. <laughs> and I'm not ashamed nor embarrassed to say that. And I'm uh, excited to be with her this coming Tuesday. And we are going to celebrate our 34th year together. And then, <laughs> and then as a result of that, uh, the following week, like uh, October 30th, we hope to stay, to spend four days, uh, five days together to start the next 34 years. <laughs> It's so good, why, why change it? And I also bring you greetings from my daughter, Nadesh, whom you have met. She's been here before. Uh, she has become a very, very lovely girl, now mom. <laughs> she married uh, a year ago, January, and now she has a, a two and a half months a girl. She is so pretty, guys. You just have to wait after the service. I will show you pictures to prove it. <laughs> and I've heard a lot about grandfather, grand, grandparents bragging about their grandchildren. I didn't know what it was like until two and a half months ago. I'm bragging. And everything I said about her is not a lie. She's the cutest girl <laughs> I've ever laid my eyes on. And she's growing so fast, and she's great. Then I join, I show you pictures, right? <laughs> She's good. And I uh, had a great time. So I thank you so much. Thank you so very much for putting up with me for so many years because you believe in a God who's greater than Leon. It's God who's working in me and in you to do what I experience here and what you've experienced in Haiti. And now, as I often say to my coworkers, my friends, my supporters, my partners, I say that and I will keep repeating it, the best is yet to come. And the same is true for this church. The best is yet to come. But the best is yet to come, it will take all of us. Every single one of us to do whatever we can for the best to be a reality. Right now, as we are worshiping the Lord right now here, uh, when I look at the temperature this morning, I say, my goodness, where are you? 42 degrees. I say, Leon, what's wrong with you? And I check on Haiti's weather, 87. I say, what? I should be in Haiti, but it won't be long, I'll be back. And, uh, but I'm glad. I'm glad I'm here to let you know that 6.30 this morning with a temperature of 80 plus degrees, there are over 3,000 people worshiping the Lord in Haiti. It's a God thing. And you are part of that excitement. You are part of what God is doing in Haiti because of your prayers and because of your support. And the best is yet to come to in Haiti. I thank you, you are sponsoring children. <coughs> The children now, we started 34 years ago with 32 children, and now we have close to 2,000 children in school. And the school is a very good school. People just wanted to come to send their children to that school because it's the best thing going on in their community. 
And I thank God for that. I thank you guys for sponsoring children. You have done that for many years. But let me tell you, out of the close to 2,000 children, we lack 40, I mean 400 sponsors. So if the Lord lays in your heart to sponsor a child, change Haiti, and especially last Monday, I turned 75. We need some new Leons on the making. And it could happen only through education. I, I'm very grateful somebody supported me to come to the States 50 some years ago, and look what education can do. Right? So please, if you could sponsor a child, Haiti would not be the same Haiti that we have now, 20 years from now. It has already changed because of, of your child. I don't know who and where that uh, somebody has been <coughs> sponsoring children in Haiti, but they are all over the world right now, changing their world their society for Christ because of education. I want you to know, my brother, my sister, we have two students who are in UK right now studying. <laughs> That's good news, right? And one of them is studying to have his PhD in a, a technical. He's good in computer. And he's studying in the UK uh, to go back to Haiti because somebody is sponsored. I'm not going to go to a whole list, but there are two more that I'd like to share with you. Another one was sponsored by somebody in the States. She's small, from Cité Soleil, the poorest area slum in Haiti. Because of her education, she's now at Harvard. Harvard, doing research. From Cité Soleil, yes, clap, this is good, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm excited. She's at Harvard doing research to go back to Haiti and serve. Last not least, the list is long, but I have to cut it short because I know t the clock is ticking. And John told me, if you don't speak under the time that we allow you, you're not coming back. <laughs> So I need to take them very seriously. <laughs> so, right now, in Haiti, we have four schools. All four of them, the principals, are former students. And of the four schools, four of them are principals of each school, and we have 18 teachers graduated from the school, they are not teachers. See what education can do? But I must tell you, there's one of the principals that I, I feel sorry for him because he's a principal of the school. He's third grade teacher, still teaching at the school. <laughs> and then one day she came to, the, to his office and he told her, I'm not gonna take that. <laughs> you need to do better. I mean, he's the principal now, but the third grade teacher is still teaching, and the students telling the third grade teacher, I'm not gonna take that from you. So pray for both of them. Because <laughs> I could see, uh, wow. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, it's all because of God, because of your support, because of your prayers. Not to mention the medical clinic, that many of you have worked at the medical clinic. We now have five doctors working at the clinic, three full-time and two part-time doctors. And they're seeing 100, sometimes 102, up to five patients a day. God is at work. And Haiti would say, bon Dieu, ap travail. God is at work. It's all the glory goes to God and lots of other things are working. If you open CNN or Fox, or look at your local news, will you hear these things? No. What you hear? Haiti is terrible. It's unsafe. All these things are true. I'm not going to say that Haiti is what it used to be 10 years ago. 
it is bad. That's why I ask you to hold on. Don't go to Haiti now, but please send your money because we have the time. We can do it for you and we're together to bring glory to God. So stay during after a worship service, you'll hear more about what God is doing. But for now, I think you need to know that good things are happening in Haiti. And Haiti needs your prayers and your support. Do not give up. Hope is there for Haiti because of your prayers and your support. Let's bow our head before we hear the word of God expose because God is going to continue to bless us during the worship service. Father, we thank you so much that you have chosen us to be your daughters and your sons. In Jesus Christ, we know we're not the same person that we once were, but now we are called children of God. You have called us from all different walks of life to be one in your son, so that together we can serve you. Together we could make a difference, not only in our community, but in the world at large. Bless us as we continue to share your word with my brothers and sisters. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. I went upstairs and then I talked with the sound guys, and they promised me they would make me sound good. <laughs> now, if you did not hear well or I don't sound good, it's not my fault. <laughs> but I think they're doing a very good job because I myself, I could hear me and that sound good already. So it's good stuff. If you are able, please listen. I would like to read a few verses with you from Acts 26. If you are able, please let's stand up and read it together from uh, Acts chapter 26, verses 19 to 22. Let's do it. I'm using the NIV. Together. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their, repent their repentance by deeds. That is why some of the Jews seized me in the temple court and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day so I stand here and testify to small and great a lack. I'm asking nothing behind what the prophets and Moses said would happen. Word of God for the people of God. May be seated. I would like to entertain you for a few minutes because I think I take a little extra in giving you what reports of what God is doing. But I'd like to share with you what I've learned from this passage. There are at least three truths that I learned from this passage. I will entertain you with the idea when we say yes to God, when we say yes to God, when we say yes to God, according to this few verses, there are three things that I see happen. One, God is first in all that we do. We no longer number one. We no longer say that it's my life. I do whatever I want with it. When we say yes to God, it's no longer to say I'm on the throne. I'm the boss. I do what I want to do. 
God becomes number one. We'll expand on that later on. The second truth that I see in this passage, when we say yes to God, we not only see our community as the only place that exists, we see our own country is the only place that exists, but the whole world. We see God as the God, the creator, but he's a creator of the whole world. So we need to be concerned about the whole world, not just ourselves. The third lesson that I learned from this passage is that when you say yes to God, tie your belt. Put on the armor, because things are not going to be as easy as you think it was going to be. When God calls you, he's not eating your favorite breakfast, <coughs> oatmeal, or drinking your favorite ice cream. It's going to be tough at times. But be ready. You're not alone. You're not by yourself. His promises are true. He will be with you. Good things will come. Let's go back. When we say yes to God, we no longer number one in our lives. God becomes second. And I know that's true with the culture that we are living here in the States or even in Haiti. You see that it's my life. What are you going to tell me that I need to live for God and please God? It's my life. I do whatever I want to do. That's a sign you haven't said yes to God yet. When you are on the throne, things are upside down. When you put God on the throne, things are just where they're supposed to be. It's a hard life when you live for yourself. When you think you are the only one living, you're having a tough time. When you reach out to others, like I was saying with some friends, when you reach out to others, it's not that you lost everything, something you gained. How many of you have been to Haiti many times? And I've heard that so many times. I've decided to go, go to Haiti thinking that I'm going to give. I bring blessings to the Haitians. And after a week I come back, I receive more than what I've given to them. When you reach out to your brothers and sisters, you don't lose anything. You gain. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, for to die is a gain. And Paul goes on to say, I would rather go now to be with Jesus. But for the sake of the gospel, I'm willing to stay and live here so that one or more will come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior because he didn't live his life as to himself. God first. And let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, my friends, I'm not preaching to you. I'm just sharing some ideas with you. God from the Garden of Eden, from the day that Adam ate the fruit, started to run away from God, from that day, God still in the calling business, come back. Come back to me. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to develop a relationship with you. And that's one thing God will never give up. To want to have a relationship with you that he has created and made to glorify him. And if you Presbyterian, you don't believe in that, Something is wrong. God still in the calling business. He's hunting you. He's talking you. I'm calling you for something special. I made you. I made you. I created you for something special. Not only to glorify me, but to serve me so that other people will know that I am God. That's a good responsibility. And you know it's not about you. God is working in you. To make that happen. Second, 
When you say yes to God, not only God is number one, not only you want to reach out to others, but when you say yes to God, Paul said, as soon as I obeyed to the heavenly vision, first I started to preach and to talk about Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his coming back from Damascus, where I met him, where he met me, I started to talk and share with him. And then he went further from Damascus to Jerusalem to Judea and to all over the world. I'm so glad Paul did that. That's because he did that, the gospel came to America and reached me, which is you. So when we say yes to God, he started working with us in our lives with the people who are close to us at the school, at your office, in the kitchen, with your husband, wife, your family, your next door neighbor, and then you reach out to others. Yes, I've heard sometimes people would say, we cannot he, uh, help Haiti because uh, things are tight these days. We have enough problems right at home. Yes, we have enough problems at home. When do you know, when, where did you get the idea that the home is USA? <coughs> Who's your neighbor? Think about that. Who's your neighbor? Your neighbor is someone who's in need, wherever that person is. And whether that neighbor is a, a Samaritan, whether it's a Jew, whether it's a Gentile, whether it's a Christian, whether, whatever. My neighbor is someone whom I could reach out to because of the need that he has. And I thank God that Paul said, yes, I started right here in Damascus, where I, have, where I met Christ. I will go to Jerusalem, where my people are. I will go to Judea, where the people that don't like very much, but they are in need of hearing the gospel. And I will go to the Gentiles, the ones that are really despised and rejected. And I think of, there are nobody, but there are nobodies in my side, but there are somebody in the side of God. And because of that, I a danger to them to preach the gospel to them. King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I started to live for God. I started to live for others. I no longer, I'm, number, I'm no longer number one. It seems like I'm number three now. And that's tough for an American, right? You're number three. What? I'm not going to take that. But try it. You like it. Try it. You like it. And third, when you say yes to God, it's not going to be easy, but it's going to be rewarding. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be rough and tough. But it is so exciting that you think, wow, what I've been missing all these days because I've been living for sin. Let me tell you. I've been in the ministry for 50 plus years. It's tough working in Haiti, especially now. Sometimes you don't know what time to go to visit churches, to visit parishioners, because there are gunshots, gangs everywhere. But you know what? God calls you. He said he'd be with you. And I know God has called me. I didn't hear like Paul on the road of Damascus. I don't hear him on the vision. But you know what? How I know I've been called by God to do what I'm doing for 50 plus years? I love it. I love it. And I'm passionate about it every day. And if I have to know the 50 years to live, I will do the same thing, except that I will do more. Because I love it. It's fun, it's exciting to see how lives have changed. It's exciting to see young men who could have been in, in Haiti with a gun 
shooting people, robbing people, but to see them deacons and elders in the church. That's exciting. And I have several of them that I know if it were not for the gospel of Christ, they would be somewhere else. It's exciting when I know there's a young man, one young man in UK studying. It's exciting to see there's a young girl who's at Harvard studying. Lord, give me more years to serve you. And I thank you so very much, my friends at home, for the 20 years or close to 20 years, you have been very close to us, serving together in Haiti. And I believe the best is yet to come. Because you keep praying, you keep supporting. And don't let the Haiti, because you cannot go for four or five years, don't let out of sight, out of mind, got you. We need you. Together we can. And together we can do more. By praying one for another, by looking up to God and say yes to God. May God bless you. May God continue to use you both here and everywhere else you're serving. Now, I know some of you try to listen to me as best as you can. I know that. I could see that in your faces. But I do know some of you do not understand more than 30% of what I said. <laughs> Maybe more, because you just understand what I just said. But let me tell you, even if you understand 30%, I'm not going to hold you responsible for 70% you did not understand, but I will hold you responsible for the 30%. Go and say yes to God. Your 30% will make a big difference in your life and the life of other people. 